Realism is a word that has almost always been thrown around the internet on the topic of games as something that is often desired but is not fully understood. It appears in far more games than you think, though the amount a game can benefit from incorporating a level of realism can widely vary from being a necessity to seriously harming the game's experience. Welcome to my medium dive of the delicate balance between realism and gameplay to seek the answer of how detailed a game mechanic should be. I don't want to claim I'm like an expert in anything, just merely an explorer. Anyway, I feel like most players, when they're expecting the game to handle stuff realistically, tend to be able to guess how a game's mechanics will work. Like, I bet as soon as you see one of these, you know to expect taking damage to matter significantly more than it would in a game that doesn't present such a screen. You may even expect certain types of injuries to lead to infections and that there's a good chance that mistakes can lead to permanent consequences. When you see this happen, you'll probably know to expect that the NPCs of the game are going to have more depth than they would in a game that doesn't present such mechanics. That they have more going on in their existences than just waiting for the player to interact with them. And when you see this, you know that if you do not close this game right this instant, you're going to have a pretty bad headache in just a few moments. While adding a ton of detail to a game mechanic can add to an experience that already supports it, it can take away from a game that doesn't need it. What often comes with complexity is tedium. It can turn what would be a beloved experience into a chore. Well, I mean, a chore for most players. I know this can all be subjective for the most part, but I mean, at the end of the day, if the overwhelming majority of opinions on something sway a certain way, you might as well treat it as practically objective, even if it technically isn't, else Concord would still be playable. If a developer isn't willing to just do away with the mechanic entirely, one can instead opt to simplify it. There's often a sweet spot you can get where the realism is strong enough that it provides a thoughtful and immersive experience without going overboard and turning the game mechanic into a chore. Which leads me to my first example. RimWorld is a top-down story generator with quite a lot of detailed simulations that you must interact with in order for your pawns, these little guys, to survive. From social relations to mental health to, most importantly, your pawn's physical health. The game isn't always super accurate, but it's still very detailed and thoughtful nonetheless. Pawns can experience many genres of suffering, from small cuts or bruises to bone fractures and lacerations. The latter of which can lead to infections, organs can be damaged, and all of the above can be permanent. Your favorite pawn one day could just be horribly and irreversibly maimed, and you will just have to deal with it. Well, I mean, not you. That's on your pawn. You get to just sit back at three times speed so the tedium part of this level of detail is almost entirely solved on its own. But what if I told you, even all of this is simplified? Take a look at this. It's so weird. This is apparently the actual anatomy of a remote pawn. Barring the weird proportions, it almost looks normal at first. And then you start to notice the fingers and toes are one bone each. As if the hands looked like... Ugh. The forearm bones and the four leg bones are melted together. And it's not shown here, but the ribs are one bone. It's so weird. You'd think... Surely they could have easily just added all of the bones, and yes, they could have, but they didn't. It was a deliberate choice to keep things from being too complicated. There's a pretty neat mod on RimWorld Steam Workshop called, well, Bones. And boy does it add a lot of them. All of them, in fact. All 206 of them. Just as the description suggests, it's unnecessary, redundant, it's... I mean, look at this. We went from a decently sized menu to this absolutely overwhelming compendium, and now when a pawn gets injured, unless you're some expert in anatomy, you don't know what a pawn's damage affects. Like, what the hell is a vomer? Oh. That bone affects nothing, by the way. The exterior of the nose is still intact, which means it doesn't affect the pawn's beauty at all. And even in the vanilla game, missing your entire nose does not hurt your ability to breathe or anything, for that matter, besides beauty. So, what's the point? There is no point. 
It just adds clutter. That health tab will now just permanently have a line of a missing part taking up space. That serves no gameplay purpose and is too much of a hassle to bother appropriately dealing with. And on the topic of too much of a hassle... Starbound, though not considered early access, is a survival sandbox that, just like so many other games of this genre, was left abandoned in a pretty unfinished state, resembling something like early No Man's Sky in terms of things to do. For the most part, it was just travel to a planet, gather resources, leave, go to a different planet, with the only advantage being the bosses in the occasional small dungeon or so. Sadly, unlike No Man's Sky, it never got to leave this awkward state. It left modders to pick up where Chucklefish left off. Fracking Universe is not only one of those mods modders have produced, but it is practically the de facto way to play the game now, with players often recommending those trying the game for the first time to immediately install Fracking Universe before even launching the game. Which is why, from this point on, I'm going to consider it part of the base game. Let me also preface what I'm about to discuss next with the fact that, overall, I think the mod is... Eh, it's... it's alright. There's some parts I really like about it, such as the new weapons and the new places to explore, but unfortunately, the game presents a huge, gigantic, pyrocynical commission-sized barrier of entry that honestly just completely blocks me off from becoming even remotely interested in playing the game with this mod past, like, tier 2, and it's the crafting system. Realistically, making things, especially anything beyond a survival game's typical stone spear or wooden club, can be very, very complicated. A gun in the real world, for example, takes so many different materials and processes to be made beyond just what you see. You don't just mine steel off the ground and slap it on a funny blue table and make engineering sounds until, boom, gun. And that's not something that Fracking Universe does either. It swings to the complete opposite end of the spectrum. Let's say you wanted to craft, uh, this helmet. Here's the ingredients you need. Seems simple, right? Well, let's start asking questions on how to acquire these items. First off, what is a quietus bar? How do I get that? From quietus or duh, but how do I get that? From a blood crystal, of course. How do I get a blood crystal? From using blood and liquid iridium on a liquid mixer. Well, okay, let's start with how do I get blood? Water and research at an alchemy. Uh, let's go back. How do I make a liquid mixer? Okay, titanium ore you get from this specific type of planet. All right, let's go over there. And let's just say we smelted it already. Now we we need a liquid collector, which you get from tungsten, tung, tungsten, what the, what? copper wire. How do you get copper wire? Putting a copper bar through a machining table. Then you need oxygen, which you get from putting water in a hand mill. Notice I'm skipping steps here, like what even a hand mill is. You shove the water in it for oxygen. Then you need a silicon board, which you get from silicon and copper wire. How do you get silicon? Extract it from sand. So now you need to head over to another specific planet, grab some sand. Realize the hand mill takes time to process. So now you've got to wait for the water to finish processing. Then you put the sand in. Now you wait for that process too. Make a silicon board so you finally make a liquid collector. Oh, by the way, you can actually make it with an electronic center, which requires even more silicon boards. Realize you don't even have enough sand to make it anymore. Go back down in line, more sand. Hand mill again, which means waiting again. Make a silicon board and then the electronic center. Make a liquid collector. Why can't I? What the hell's a 15 J? You know what? I'm done. I'm done. If this perhaps seems overwhelming at all. It is. It's an extreme example of detail being taken way too far. I personally don't see how anyone can run with this, but people do. I know I literally just made it out like this is an absolutely horrid thing, but this mod has generated quite a loyal following with some players amassing thousands of hours on the game thanks to this mod alone. Sometimes this super unnecessary attention to detail works, which brings me to my next example, a game that basically all of my original audience is no doubt deeply familiar with. Rain World is known for how unapologetically realistic its creatures are, in the sense that it doesn't treat the player any different from any other entity in the game. It tries and does a pretty decently good job at simulating an entire ecosystem and in it simply plops you right around here. Not very high. Rainworld doesn't make you a hero or an unstoppable demigod. Not anywhere close to that. You're just some creature. A slug cat. Just a simple small part of something much, much greater. In fact, your slug cat is honestly kinda useless. You're not very fast, you don't have any way to defend yourself besides throwing these funny sticks or whatever else you can find around the world. You die in one hit too, like 
pretty much everything, and what doesn't usually can cripple you quite terribly. And people like this game. Yes, there are three important details about what I have been just saying. One, the creatures react realistically to its environment. If you make yourself not worth pursuing, they're not going to pursue you. Two, this is an ecosystem. For better or for worse, you're not the center of the game's world, and you can take advantage of that. Three, you have to seek and use everything you can find to your advantage. This isn't just some side-scroller where you can just shoot gun at funny creature. You are prey. An encounter requires you to be cunning, vigilant, and modest. No encounter is ever to be taken lightly, no matter how much experience you have. One wrong move, one overestimation of your own skill, or underestimation of a creature, and it's over. The unapologetic realism present in Rainworld's ecosystem results in a highly interactive and exploitable world. Slug cats have a parallel with humans in a way. Both humans and slug cats on paper are quite an unoppressive species. Ignoring the fact that the latter are like way more adorable than the former. Both excel simply through the ability to thoughtfully manipulate any situation to their advantage and come out on top. Going really hard on cramming as much detail as you can into something doesn't automatically make it unfun or boring. I'm sure if Fracking Universe's crafting was actually any sort of engaging to interact with, and the UI in navigation, if possible, was completely overhauled to be less clunky to interact with, then I wouldn't have anything to say about it. But the fact that navigating through that involves such cluttered menus, and even worse, a wiki, I think it would have been better off with most of that complexity just outright gutted. But anyway, with the discussion of the simplification, redundancy, and appeal of realism out of the way, let's take a look at a game in which realism is a necessity. Specifically, zombies in video games are a very, very exhausted and saturated type of enemy. Which is why it's so impressive that the creators of Project Zomboid managed to make the most boring type of zombie. You know, the ones with no special quirks that just walk at you. Absolutely terrifying. And it's not by changing how the zombie interacts with you. No, not at all. Instead, they change how you interact with it. And it's not just the basic stuff like food and water. Let's say you're going around smacking some zombies, right? Look at how many hits it takes. I mean, let's ignore the fact that you don't even know how to swing a frying pan. Look at how bro is built. You're built like XQC. You're not cracking open that skull. And look at that horde. Good luck trying to escape. You have no stamina. Even less than none because you just burned it all thinking you could two-tap a zombie fresh out of spawn. You could barely handle just one of them. What the hell are you gonna do now? Nothing! You're cooked! It's over! If you wanna actually be able to take on something like that, you have to be prepared. Well-trained, well-fed, well-equipped, and with your head in the game. You have to maintain a well-balanced diet. That's right, you need to read the food labels on your stuff. The game tracks your carbohydrates, proteins, and fats alongside calories. You have to actually work out, training both your upper and lower body, which can result in your body getting sore, by the way. You remember how I was calling the slug cat in the previous part useless? Well, at least the slug cat can actually move, man. My guy has so much muscle fatigue in his legs that he can't even run properly. And yes, you saw that right, you can trip and fall. So be careful with where you run and where you sprint because one wrong move and you're on the floor and the zombies love when you bust your ass. Your body certainly won't though. Wounds are terribly punishing and there's lots of ways to get hurt without even fighting anything. They take forever to heal and can make it even more difficult to survive. And if the wound is from a zombie, you better hope it ain't a bite. You're never safe around zombies, no matter how good your condition is. They don't get tired or hungry. They don't get sad. They don't panic. They don't feel pain. They don't get bored. They don't feel cold and they don't need blood, but you do. 
But what they do have and you don't is numbers, overwhelming numbers, while it's just you. The reason these boring zombies can be so scary is because it pits this unstoppable, unrelenting force on just little, most likely realistically depicted you. So, how detailed should a game mechanic be? Well, I think it depends on if the detail adds onto or enhances the main experience of the game in some way. And it's easy to see if a game does it right by if the game would be significantly worse off if it didn't have such a detail. If you took away Rain World's highly detailed ecosystem, predator eating prey, prey running from predator, you end up having just pretty basic enemies that really do nothing but just walk at you, touch you, and you die. Which, at that point, it's just the original Mario. If you took away Zomboid's suffocating limitations on a player, you wouldn't need the food and water that they safeguard, would you? You could easily keep as much distance as you desire from them. At that point, it just effectively has as much gameplay as a simple hobbyist prototype. If the level of detail of your game mechanic is too high to the point that it would take away from the experience, then you could probably just simplify a bit like with Rimworld's pawn anatomy. And if even simplifying it doesn't fix anything, you might want to consider doing away with it entirely. But uh, take everything I have just said with a grain of salt. I have never completed making a game before. This is just at best a study or something, not advice. I have no idea what I'm doing, just trying a new video format to see if I like it and most importantly if those viewing this enjoyed it. I know I for sure absolutely loved making this. It was pretty fun, so if this video turns out to be successful, I would gladly make more as soon as I can come up with new video topics. You could actually help with that if you want by recommending me video games and potential topics to discuss. And if you really enjoyed any aspect of this video, I accept and highly appreciate donations and memberships on my Buy Me A Coffee. And I'm very easily reachable on my Discord. Thank you to my current members, Buddy from OST, wait, no, but, but Buddy from ODST, Bell, I Freeze, I hope I pronounced that right, Rorky Ro 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 is bored, someone, Saint, The Glitchers, Malmo, and Peanut. I highly appreciate your faith in me, despite me having, like I said, no clue what I'm doing. Thank you for watching. Also, here's a little Easter egg for those who haven't clicked off already. Um, this is a little blooper reel that I made with a friend when I was doing the voice lines. Please make sure to make fun of me in the Discord.